Welcome to Establish the Edge. I'm your host, Mike Leone. Excited to bring on Davis Maddock of SportsGrid and the Tate cast for today's episode, which is going to be hot takes, bold predictions. You know, we've done a lot of analysis on the show. Uh, I need to unwind a little bit. It's a stressful time before the season. So we'll do that. Before we get into that, though, want to note that this podcast is brought to you by Underdog Fantasy right now in Best Ball Mania 3. They've got a $2 million gram prize. They also have a million dollar second place and a million dollars to the regular season points leaders. So three different ways you can win a million dollars and you can get up to a hundred dollars matched on your first deposit if you use promo code ETR. This is a great way to prepare for your home leagues to get in these real money leagues on underdog fantasy. So head over there, use promo code ETR for $100 in free entries. Now to, to, to today's episode, I have a feeling my takes are going to be like lukewarm and Davis yours are just going to be absolutely blistering. I mean, you've spent you've sp- I mean you uh, you've spent too much time grinding, you know, the micro projection, so you understand <laughs> how insane uh, these changes are going to be. I I have worked through projections and and you know some of my takes that I'm using to draft look horrible in my projections. You know, like so like trying to to get all these Chiefs players to a number that would make sense for my exposure. So I I think I have a sense of how insane some of what I'm about to say actually is, which um I think makes the takes even more blistering. I love it. So we don't know each other's takes. There's we there's don't. no podcast outline for this episode. We want organic reactions. You're the guest. Do you want to go first or second? I want to go first because I think it's probably the most interesting thing. And I think it. I think this is going to be the biggest impact on the fantasy season if what I say is true. So I think Mahomes is going to have his best volume season of his career up until this point. I think the Chiefs offense, I, you know, the, the year he won MVP, he had an 8.9% touchdown rate. Now he didn't run very much. And they also had like a, a stable of running backs they felt more comfortable with than the group of guys they have now. But I think that he will top at least at least the 5,000 yard mark. I think he could get to like 5,400 yards. Maybe it'll be 47 touchdowns instead of 50. Um, but I mean, really, the, the hot take is I don't think it will look on field like the Chiefs miss Tyreek Hill very much. And in fact, the removal of the Demarcus Robinson, Byron Pringle, McCole Hardman, Blake Bell snaps, you know, introducing MBS, Juju, Sky, Noah Gray, and particularly Jody Fortson. I, I think the, the Fortson playing with the first team stuff is actually kind of um, – it's like a look into what they're trying to accomplish on offense, removing Blake Bell and Noah Gray and adding in a guy who's a converted wide receiver as their second tight end. I think they're just going to throw the piss out of the ball, basically. That Yeah, that would be amazing. And Mahomes is way cheaper than he's ever been before. So you can you can get him at a, a cost where I wouldn't even say it's a tournament play. Like you could definitely take you, him in a regular league if it's... You could just take him in a home league. Yeah. Yeah, and get that stack. That flows into one of my hot takes which i know we agree on but which i the, completely agree with the juju smith schuster smash season is coming so if patrick mahomes does what you're saying uh one travis kelsey probably still has one more year before you know he hits the age club i i actually think the kelsey de- this is going to be such an oxymoron i actually think the kelsey decline will help mahomes for fantasy a little bit because one of the big problems we've had well, now in we're years hot Well, one of the big problems we've had in the last two years with Mahomes is either the Chiefs are getting blown out in some of these embarrassing games against like the Titans and the Bills, or the converse happens, you know, they play the Raiders or the Texans or whatever, and they score four touchdowns in the first half and it's completely over. And I think we're going to find a nice middle for that this season in which they're not blowing teams out as frequently because they are not quite as good. Uh, quite as efficient without Tyreek Hill, but also they are not going to be getting blown out because they're not, they're they're not going to be as high variance because they're not playing three guys every down who stink. Yeah. And I mean, the division's good. It's the best division in football. So that's also, I I've run with that way too much. That actually flows into another one of my hot takes that we'll get to, but with Juju, you know, the camp reports are good. I think we could see him easily going in like the second round of fantasy drafts next season. So I'm really into Juju. Uh, the Big Ben, st- I mean, Big Ben was just so, so bad. And I don't think Juju was fully healthy. He's still young enough that he's like in early peak years. It's, you know, he's going to be his age 26 season. He has some elite numbers historically. 
And I'm on like the the Bill James, if you show a skill, you own it kind of train with Juju. Well, well Corain, Corain made this point, and people think of this the other way. So what they think of is they're like, well, Deontay Johnson did so good in that offense. Why would Juju not do well in that offense? But Juju was actually being targeted in a less efficient way, shorter parts of the field. Like Deontay was earning some deep targets. Juju was like not even running those routes. He was he was basically being used as like fancy Jarvis Landry. But still, again, uh, if you if you want to make the argument of if you if you display that skill, you own that skill in the middle of what you would call the the disappointing juju run uh he did throw up 13 157 and one in a playoff game right like i just yeah i completely disagree with this idea that like he he is just jarvis landry and he, he has no down the field skill or anything like that i think that's totally wrong he also was basically the same as deontay johnson in 2020 like people forget like, he only played five games last year and he was you know terrible juju but he was the same as deontay johnson in 2020 um and people People tend to forget that. So, um, all right, Davis, hot take number two. KJ Hamler leads the Denver oh. Broncos in receiving touchdowns. Okay, um, we, we went from we we jumped to blistering. Well, it's like it's like you gotta you gotta it, it, you have to you have to game it out and you gotta be like, okay, this one I can at least see being passable <laughs> or whatever, and then you gotta get you gotta get to the real stuff. And so I I there are a couple reasons why I think this could be true, and also how it could both inform and not inform the way you're drafting. The the first thing being, if KJ Hamler does lead the Denver Broncos in receiving touchdowns, I think that means that Russell Wilson is having the best deep passing season of his career. Because if you look at the guys they have available, he is actually, to me, the better fit for what Tyler Lockett used to do than what Sutton and Judy provide, right? So Sutton, I guess, theoretically, is kind of the deep target, but he's also had two catastrophic knee injuries now. You would have, and I guess KJ Hamler also had a catastrophic <laughs> knee injury. But well, you would, you would sort rolling. of. I, I mean, I it's Don't it's stop like, him. He's on a roll. No, no. But it, if you just if you just kind of picture in your mind's eye, and this is why this is not a database take. Who is the guy you can see in your head catching the Tyler Lockett moon balls? You know, for me, it's KJ Hamler because he kind of already has done that, just with way worse quarterbacks and. Hamler was never going to be a good fit with Teddy or Locke or like, you know, all these losers that have played quarterback for the Denver Broncos. But Hamler, Hamler is kind of like, I, I would actually say he's like a souped up version of what David Moore was for the Seattle Seahawks, where he was only out there to run nine routes. And it's basically like you induce a little bit of positive variance on the down the field targets. And I mean, literally no one wants to talk about this. But Jerry Judy and Corlin Sutton have just not been very good NFL players. It's it's a lot of like these guys are really good prospects. Uh, uh, Sutton flashed a lot as a rookie, and Judy basically had a really good half last year before he had that high ankle sprain. And I'm I'm a little bit lower on those guys as talents, higher on Hamler as a talent. And with Tim Patrick injured, I mean their backup wide receiver room is like, I mean they have no one who is going to get these guys off the field. Yeah, I just worry that Hamler is this prospect that sometimes we see from an analytics community standpoint where it's like, oh, he's undervalued. And then we prop him up like more than where he should be valued just because he's undervalued. Does that make sense? I mean, yeah, of course. Of course it makes sense. Like KJ Hamler is probably not a player who has ever cut out to like earn 120 targets. But I, I mean, this is definitely something that that people like you and I who are so granular and in the weeds forget before the season. Sometimes a player season can be defined by like running hot on like three plays. Yeah. Right. Like if KJ Hamler earns uh, 14 targets, 30 yards down the field or more and converts two extra of those, like the safety slips, or he just gets lucky and finds the end zone on two of them versus getting tackled at the two, that completely changes his fantasy outcome, changes Russell Wilson's outcome, can change playing time distribution going forward. Like the coaching staff is like, guy's always open. We should play him more. We should target him more. So that is that is why, obviously, I am not drafting this way. It's not influencing like my median uh, projections or rankings, but it is something that uh, I think is completely in the range. All right. I'm going to stick with the NFC West and I'll, I'll go kind of hot. I will say the overall wide receiver one in PPR leagues is going to be Devonte Adams. And a lot, I think people are way too worried about the shift I, away from. 
I'm worried. I, I am one of these people Aren't that has you a worried? Hard, I, I am the- one of these people that has a hard time clicking on Devontae Adams. This is supposed to be the, um, even though I just did it to you with Hamler, this is the aren't you worried free zone. We've had to deal with the aren't you worried too much. We're just focused on it. We're, we're not We're not worried. We're not worried. We're not worried. So my Adam's take is, I mean, clearly him and Rodgers had a unique connection, yes. but I think he's going to a spot where Derek Carr is completing like 68, 69% of his passes for four straight years, really high yards per attempt where I don't think the downgrade is as significant as the market. And I also think everyone's like, well, you know, and even I haven't projected like a 25% target share, which is down from like. That's so, know, so 30s. same as well. When I tried to project him for his green Bay esque target share, it, it just made like Waller and Renfro unusable basically. So I'm hopeful that one will be super condensed, but it makes sense from a median perspective to have him like 25%. But w- what if he's just that good? I mean, he's very talented wide receiver. He can do basically everything. Um, you know, not quite the burner type, but he's like Michael Thomas with a little bit more juice. Yeah. And what if he just earns 30, you know, another 32% target share because he's that good. Plus you're in a division again, where they're the worst team in a division that is loaded and is going to have a lot of fun offensive games. They're going to have to throw a lot. They're going to throw way more than Green Bay did last year. So you might lose some efficiency, but I think you gain total team volume. And he could just have an absurd amount of targets and catch those targets at a really high rate, which is why I kind of specified full PPR. But you know, if he catches like 76% of his targets and he sees 175 targets, like that could be um, a massive, massive season. So I'm going to go Devonta Adams overall wide receiver one. So... This is this is where I'm at on that. And and maybe this is actually probably a hot take in and of itself. This is actually probably like the reverse bold take. I I do wonder how much of Devonte Adams is truly insane fantasy production was I mean I I am not saying Devonte Adams is bad. Clearly I think Devonte Adams is very good, but I do wonder how much of like the difference between Devonte Adams and Keenan Allen in terms of fantasy output is not Soul, not not uh, not to credit to Devonte Adams' skill, but credit to Aaron Rodgers' stubbornness, right? Like, I mean, we all we all know from from playing uh, cash games, which you you uh, you don't remember, but like, you just have to play right, Adams right. because the Green Bay the Green Bay Packers get to the two yard line, and there's there's not even a thought of trying to throw to uh, you know Alan Lazard or, or uh, MBS. It's just all Devonte Adams, right? I- I know that, like, I remember I was fading Adams one time last year. I think it was in a showdown. I think it was actually like an NFT fantasy league. I was fading him. So, like, the Sunday night game counted. He's one on one on the goal line. And to your point, like, you know, Rogers is going to throw to him, but he also, in like half a second, is wide open in the end zone because he just is that good by the goal. But, but, like, anybody so, so could this, throw is, that this is the element, though. This is the element, though. Rogers can anticipate that because he's an alien. Right? Is Derek Carr? Is Derek Carr that good? You so, know? I'm I'm worried. I mean, if we want to get hot takes, like I'm worried that Green Bay is just going to have sh- is going to have some problems. Yes. Other than Aaron Jones, well, well, this if, could flow into my next next hot take, which is I, I'm going to take two in a row because it segues a little bit. But I think Alan Lazard is going to be a huge disappointment. Yeah, th- I, I mean, think, this this is not even a hot take. I just think well, all people agree on this like he's a bad no guy. they don't <laughs> they don't i mean he he goes early man i mean not early but he, he's like a wide receiver three in ad well, give give the thesis while i look up some stats because i also i also agree with this one so i think i think almost the opposite like rogers had a really difficult time for a while until Devonte adams was super good like he had a stretch where we thought rogers was done um so i i almost think what if Adams is carrying Aaron Rodgers to an extent and Rodgers has a tough time with this wide receiver room? I think I would much rather have, I think in a vacuum, honestly, this is my, my hot take, which is maybe just bad drafting, but I think sure. if I had to choose in a vacuum, I would take Romeo Dobbs over Alan Lazard, like straight up, like not even ADP adjusted. Well, I would take Christian Watson over both of them. Really? Because- not 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 including straight up, but just at, at what all of what they cost right now. 
Like I and, no, I was and people straight up. People have been people have been making this point to me like draft capital doesn't matter if Dobbs is having a good preseason and Watson has been injured, but it's like just like kind of everything I know about fantasy football is that the team is going to give the guy they just spent uh, the much higher pick on a lot more chances and a lot longer leash. Like they are for sure. Rogers is get... different, man. He's just, uh, he's a psychopath. He well, I mean, Alan, Alan Lazard spent three seasons on the Packers practice squad before he, he got a chance yeah. basically due to circumstance. I mean, the, the thing is, is just, if you look in NFL history, how many guys are going to go into their age 27 season, their fifth season in the NFL Never had a thousand yards, never even had 600 yards, never topped 40. I mean, is is there, is there a historical comp for a guy coming into there with like, I mean, he has 1400 scrimmage yards in his career. This is like, I just, I don't know, man. It seems bad. He, I mean, his target shares are so low in some of those games too. Like I know he had a decent second half of the season, but dude, he had games where he was getting like 8% target shares. Like I know Devontae Adams was there, but there's still like 68% of the other targets to go to someone. So yeah, I'm down on him. I think Aaron Jones is going to catch like 75 balls as part of my- I, I mean, clearly my my corresponding hot take is that you should just take all the Packers receivers who are cheap. Dobbs, Watkins, Cobb. I, I mean, I, th- I think Cobb and Watkins are mm-hmm. like basically the best last round wide receiver picks that we've had in a while, like in recent memory. I have a bet with, uh, maybe I just hate Alan Lazard, but I have a bet with Pat Mayo that Sammy Watkins has more targets per game than Alan Lazard. Um, but I mean, one, he probably other, will. One other thing on the Devonta Adams stuff, he had 2.82 yards per route run last year, which was third in the NFL. Um, Cooper Cup ran like 75 more routes than Devonta Adams. Yeah. So if that evens up, or maybe even flips the other way. That's how Devonte Adams flips Cooper Cup. But I also wonder if there's a nightmare scenario with Green Bay where it's like they're just not good and they're super spread out. Well, and- the nightmare scenario is that the offense kind of stinks, but the defense is the best in the NFL. So they just win all these 17 to 10 games and they're handing the ball off to AJ Dillon 16 times a game. Aaron Jones is getting 15 to 18 touches a game. Rodgers kind of goes back into his very conservative shell. I mean, the the world none of us want to live in is the world where Randall Cobb leads the Green Bay Packers in targets per game. All right. I I stole the order back. So it, it's definitely your turn for what do you got next? Uh, that we spent all offseason being hyped on Traylon Burks and Drake London and Chris Olave and Jahan Dotson and all this stuff. And George Pickens ends up being the guy who is the answer to who is this year's chase Jefferson CD, you know, rookie wide receiver who finishes in the top 20 or top 15 and fantasy points per game. Um, so the first, the, the, the first part of this is that the market seemed to have been too low on Pickett early on because the, the reports from trainer camp were that Pickett sucks and he's behind Mason Rudolph and he can't do anything. And then we get into the preseason games and there's like a marked difference between the Trubisky Rudolph offense and Pickett. Like Pickett is just, I mean, I I think probably the biggest difference between Pickett and those two guys, honestly, is maybe not even skill level, but those guys at this stage in their career are just so afraid to mess up because Trubisky is like, you know, running out the edge of his contract. Uh, Rudolph saying like, these guys are closer to being out of the league than being signed to starters. Whereas Pickett is like, I just went in the first round. I just had like the best season uh, that my college has had in forever. I was getting Heisman votes. Like, what does he have to be afraid of? That's the first thing. The second thing is that to, and again, people are going to disagree with this. Deontay Johnson was always a fantasy superstar to me, more out of circumstance and good fit with his quarterback than that. He's just this amazing player. And, I know like Harmon's um, reception perception stuff is like, he just always wins and he always gets open. But to me, George Pickens, uh, the first thing is he, because of the college he went to and because he got hurt, like we just didn't really get an idea of how good he is. I think if Pickens went to Alabama, Oklahoma, you know, one of these schools where it's all about, you know, featuring these stud guys to get them into the NFL, I think he would have been 
uh, the number one. Like, I think he could have gone first in this draft. I think there is a chance that he's the most talented wide receiver in this class. And he's still at a good price, too. Like, like wide receiver yeah. 50 is actually a very equitable price for him if he's as good as I think he is. Yeah, I like Pickens. I've got him just ahead of – got him just inside the top 100 overall. Um, I mean, he's locked into two wide receiver sets. Like, he's they're starting they, – They moved Claypool into the slot, which is yeah. huge. I think – the offense in general could just be better than people think because Big Ben was so bad. And and, and the offensive line is terrible. The offensive but, line is terrible. But, but, but again, one of these things that we've learned is that the better your quarterback is, the less the quality of the offensive line matters, that these mid-tier quarterbacks are way more sensitive to offensive line quality. And, like, what if Pickett's really good? What what if, I mean, if Pickett – or if Pickett is even better than Big Ben, right? If he's 15% better than late-stage Big Ben – that's pretty big for their receivers. Yeah. And I honestly, I like both Pickett and Claypool. I think Claypool, even though his routes might be down a little bit, like they're going to be playing three wide most of the time anyways, that if he runs 80% routes instead of a hundred, because he's not playing too wide, I don't care. Like, I mean, he's a massive slot wide receiver. And I, I don't know. I think the upside there is pretty, pretty tremendous from an efficiency standpoint. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The, the, that one I feel really good about. One, because uh, I took him in all these dynasty leagues that, that you and I are in together. And uh, that it's it's like, you know, it feels good to watch your bags appreciate, essentially. Oh, yeah. I've got like 60% Isaiah Pacheco, thanks to JJ. <laughs> just, like, there you go. It's like, ah. um, all right. I will throw out. All right, I think there's a chance the Eagles throw way more than people think. And Jalen Hurts. I mean, they they have simply season. Leone, they have simply told us they are going to do that. I mean, they but they they don't believe it. What, but what, it's like this is actually insane to me. Like, I'm actually funny that you mentioned this. I'm at, literally actually arguing this with our friend Drew B right now because we are on the clock in the eighth round of the FFPC main event, trying to decide between Devonta Smith or Kadarius Tony. And the room the room thinks Devonta Smith is the the the, the three condom pick. And not a one million dollar pick, but I think Devonta is totally a one million dollar pick. Devonta is a one million dollar pick. I mean, I like AJ Brown more, but I think there might be enough room for them both to do really well. Obviously, if Devonta smashes, he probably overtakes AJ Brown, and AJ Brown's a disappointment at his ADP. But I know Siegel like absolutely loves Devonta Smith, and he's well, he good he had that. the real fire take that AJ Brown was brought in to free up Devonta Smith to be a wide receiver one. <laughs> Yeah, I'm not quite there, but we have Tony and Smith back to back. I think I would take Smith based on feel. Just, I mean, some of the, t like, I hate people who overweight injury risk, and I have a ton of Tony, but if it's like that tight, like, there's a little bit of Tony, just kind of seems like he's constantly like banged up a little bit. And I, 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 would, I would say team. he's the number one. There's always something going on with him, guy in the NFL right now. Yeah. And I, again, I, I have this hot take, which is only, a, it's a little bit in the projections and our rankings, but it's not all the way there. So yeah, I think the Philly offense could go nuclear. The one guy I've been having trouble with though, is like Goddard's price is like pretty high. And I'm just like, like, I couldn't really get it. Like, I think he's ranked correctly positionally. It's just, I think he's boosted too much because people are chasing tight end after missing the elite guys. Um, I mean, I think that's probably true on Goddard because also the thesis with most most tight ends is that they're going to score a lot of touchdowns. But the Eagles' best option in the red zone is either AJ Brown or Jalen Hurts just running, right? Like that. That like I could see Goddard uh, having his positional allocation of targets, like being like he finishes the tight end eight in targets, but only scoring like four touchdowns, right? Yeah. Or I mean, he is. A, yeah, he's the tight end eight overall, and it just doesn't matter that much. Um. But yeah, so I'm in on Philly. Let's let's go to your next one. I don't know how many you've got written down. I've got a couple more. I mean, I have. I could. I could. <laughs> I could go all. I could, I could. I could do. I could do these infinitely. Um, this is this is one I I want your opinion on because it is uh, near and dear to your heart. But Josh Allen last season had a 6.8 YPA. He had 15 interceptions. Uh, he ran pretty hot with fumbles to fumbles lost like when when he would be fumbling the ball the team would be getting it back more often than they would not he fumbled eight times and i think he only lost one which is uh not not a great sign so i i do wonder 
it, and and also you know obviously Brian Dable leaving. I wonder if we see uh, the Bills come back to be like the seventh best offense in football instead of this like machine. And I I do think also the the Zach Moss stuff is an indication that they're just kind of looking at their their team and they're like we just gotta we gotta get a little bit more grounded pound right like we got it we gotta stay on schedule a little bit more which is super frustrating for us from a fantasy perspective and also they have no what, they what have is no, what's the hot what's the conclusion here though what's the, the conclusion the conclusion is that uh the bills are just going to be a less fantasy friendly offense the Diggs is a yeah. little overdrafted G- davis is a little overdrafted and actually shakir jameson crowder uh, and Dawson Knox are maybe a little bit underdrafted because it'll be a little bit more of a group effort versus those two guys just getting pelted with targets. I mean, the, yeah, I mean, the, I've the, I've been taking Adams over Diggs, but yeah. I think I think Gabriel Davis playing full time could help the efficiency come back. I mean, they were I agree. Throwing to, I agree. They were throwing to Manny Sanders and Cole Beasley last year. I think that could help. I have though had the concerns with the. Some of the stuff that went down with Dable and McDermott sounded like McDermott wanted to establish it a little bit yes. more. And now the guy in is like more like going to do what McDermott. I, wanted I by the way, I, by the way, have the exact same concerns with the Cincinnati Bengals and Crane to uh, Crane and Gretch were like giving me these big, long, uh, you know, evidence based appeals about that. But I was like, the only thing I can think of is like, you know, the, the the Bengals come off this game where Burrow throws for like 400 yards and Chase looks like literally Superman. And then Zach Taylor in the press conference would be like, we got to run a little bit more. We got to stay on schedule. Like that's that's all I can think of. Dude, Zach, I mean, I think there's some signs that the Bengals could go full nuclear, but it's not it's not the expected they, outcome. If, by if, they, if they have Zach, to... If, Zach Taylor if, is Sean McVay, right? Like, yes. I mean, he's Sean McVay, which is like... The offense is gonna be fine. It's gonna be good, but he's never he's not gonna be top five in PROE. But they only need to be like like if they were like ninth in PROE, that would be really good. And they yeah. were in Burroughs rookie year, they were a little bit faster paced, a little bit more pass happy. Um that's part of the reason I was into them last year, and it kind of worked out that they just went scorching on efficiency. But but yeah. back to the Bills thing, I'm a little bit worried, but I, just, I don't know how much of an like I'm I'm worried about Diggs. Like I don't know why. That's Diggs is well, the, guy Diggs is the one. That. Diggs is the one who has the most to lose, right? So if they go yeah. from being the super aggressive offense to slightly above league average, and 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 also if Crowder and Shakir and these guys are like earning targets at any reasonable rate, he goes from being like 170 target guy to like 140 target guy, and yeah. It, and it's, that that stinks. It's definitely. I feel like because we all love Diggs as a fantasy community, but like if I was touting a twenty-nine-year-old wide receiver that just went from nine point two yards per target to seven and a half, I feel like people would be like making fun of me for staying with the old. Um, yeah, but nobody brings that up with Stefan Diggs. Uh, so I think he's fine at the one-two turn, but like I am a little bit worried. Yeah. I mean, you gotta you gotta be a little bit worried about everything. So if I want, uh, aren't you worried? Take it's the San Francisco pass catchers that none of them have. Debo a, a Debo league could league turn league. out to be the worst fantasy pick of a guy who stays healthy for seventeen games in recent memory. He has that outcome in there, and the Ayuk thing again. Like I like Ayuk, I think he's a breakout candidate, but he's still a tough click for me where he goes. Kittle, I've been taking because he goes late enough where I'm just like, whatever, he's so talented and it's tight end and it could be super elite. But, dude, I think what you said about Green Bay with the defense, I mean, that could happen in San Francisco where their defense yes. is so And good. their offensive line stinks too. And Trey Lance is running a lot and taking a lot of sacks. And, and Shanahan's just like, we're, we're going to just play so conservative. We're going to run so much. And, we, I mean, even if the offensive line stinks, they're like – I'm more worried about that in pass protection because he just seems to be able to scheme an efficient rushing game no matter what. So uh, none of, you you could have be underweight on all three San Francisco pass catchers, and I think there's a good chance that it doesn't burn you. Yes. Um, well, I think being underweight on all three will burn you because my guess is that one of Debo, Kittle, 
or Ayuk just by the nature of the season will end up be like beating expectation. That could be Debo running for eight touchdowns again. It could be Kittle mm-hmm. finally staying healthy and not playing right tackle. Yeah, but that's not uh, a hot take, Davis. We have to go hot. Well, one, of I, could get, one of them my, could get hurt too. And then my, my hot them. take would be that a big part of Debo's contract thing is he's like, dude, I don't want to get tackled 15 times a game. And him and Ayuk flip roles. And what if Brandon Ayuk is actually the San Francisco 49ers Debo Samuel? Ayuk's first NFL touchdown was a rushing touchdown. Yeah. People, um, people forget. People forget. The other thing that I'm like afraid to say, but I think in sharp leagues, there are times when Trey Lance is overvalued. And then in casual leagues, he's super undervalued. Um, he's only overvalued if he's going ahead of Jalen Hurts. That that's it. That's it. Yeah, I think it's I think it's a tier break. I guess for me, it's like, not because Trey Lance tier. Trey Lance could be Mason Rudolph as a passer, and it doesn't matter if he runs two hundred times. But it matters a little bit in today's NFL. It's harder if, to... if he runs for eleven hundred yards and eight. Well, touchdowns, if he runs for eleven hundred, but if he runs for six hundred and eight, then he's probably he, not a good pick, right? Like. He, he, I think he's got to get. I think he's got to get to eight hundred or be better than we anticipate as a passer. And he could be. I, I I like Lance in casual leagues. He's like a slam dunk. I mean, even in some FFPCs, I've seen him fall because he's like other people see that as a tier drop off. But I've also seen people that think he's in the same tier as like hurts in them. And I think that's looking. At I I do I do only. I do think he's in that same tier because all I care about is upside really with quarterbacks. Uh, even even in the higher FF- opportunity cost position than it's been in the past i think that's that's a little bit wrong to only care about well it's only players. only if you don't think that lance has the same range of outcomes as hurts and kyler which i do but the the argument for the argument for taking lance is that uh either you were gonna so you're at a point in the draft and you you don't take lance and then you have to take Kirk cousins or Derek carr or two or whatever that, I mean, that's what i'm saying that's what I'm saying. You so it's like take him in round six. Like I think Burrow, Brady, Dak. Like I think he's closer to Burrow, Brady, Dak than he is to Hertz. Well, sure, whatever. But I, I just, I, I'm not, I'm not with this, this Trey Lance fud. Aren't you? Tra- no, I'm literally not. Like because, because you know so clearly the bet you're making with Trey Lance is that he is yeah. going to run fifteen ish, fourteen. No, he's, pro- he's probably not going to be bad. Me. Maybe my take is is almost like so clearly like the very high percentile outcomes are absolute smashes and he goes nuts. So maybe and I think his floor because the Russians are actually fine. I think I guess my take is maybe more like the the 80th percentile outcome. I think is like not as flashy as everyone assumes. Um, I could I could see that being true. I could I could I mean just because I really think with their offensive line being bad and their defense being so good, he really could struggle. Yeah, I mean, we have no idea if he's any good. Like, and he's being drafted as a seventh quarterback. I think he's pretty good, but I hope he is. Yeah, uh, my my fire wide receiver take is that Chris Godwin's ADP has been a gift all off season, and that he is one of the few guys who could actually finish as the number one wide receiver in fantasy football. Like, he's way ahead of like he literally might be active week one. Like the like Chris Godwin has been drafted in at like the five, six turn for a huge chunk of this off season. And we are 10 days away from the season and we might get the inactives report and Jalen Darden is inactive. And Chris Godwin is out there running 90% of the routes with Brady. And by the way, I think the fact that their offensive line has had all these injuries is, is um, maybe a smidge bullish for Godwin and bearish for Mike Evans, because 45 year old Tom Brady is not trying to get hit. It is going to be, it is going to be, and Godwin is going to have exclusively the slot, right? Like, I mean, there he is going to be there all year. I, I mean, I'm 100 percent on board. I have, he might be my most like my highest. I just it, it doesn't make it's any insane. sense though. It makes no sense whatsoever. We took him in our shared main event, and that's like almost part of the reason we passed on Mike Evans at the two three turn is we get Godwin at the four five turn. I I think Chris Godwin over six over 17 games would project better than Mike Evans. I think he would. I think Gretch said Godwin would be two rounds ahead. I don't think I'm quite there, but I would have him ahead of Evans. But regardless, the ADP is an absolute gift. And it's one of those ones where I expected late steam 
it hasn't happened in home leagues. Like I did an auction yesterday. I got him for $14 in a $200 budget league where, where people had a lot of extra money because of keepers. So most of the, like a hunter rent for a one in the twenties and I got Chris Godwin, you know, for 14 bucks and, and no one, no one was like good pick either. <laughs> Everyone's like, maybe that's a keeper next year. Like, like <laughs> yeah, it's it's it's. I feel as if maybe people just don't buy that he's actually ahead of his recovery. Like, maybe maybe the market is just still anticipating. Maybe he only plays thirteen games instead of seventeen games. In which case, I still think he could lead all wide receivers in fantasy points per game. Like, if you look at if you actually look at what Godwin has accomplished in his NFL career, it basically looks exactly like what you want a guy that he's gotten better. Every single year, he you know has already knocked out multiple a thousand yard seasons. Like he has been uh, a touchdown producer, even playing out of a non touchdown producing spot. And like he just he has just been great. I don't get it. I I mean to me, I I would probably have him right now as a third round pick. Okay, um, yeah, I'm absolutely on board with that. I got a couple more. Oh, also, I think advances in medicine like we continually under. Ray and another Cam Akers guy came he, back from an Achilles injury in six months. And now there's like Sterling Shepard and James Robinson are back. Like not that those are yes. good picks, but like they're back still. So, yeah. Yeah. And now it's multiple guys doing something that no one did before. Hmm. Maybe, maybe something changed your boy, Michael Gallup, you know, I was giving you shit about taking Michael Gallup. Gallup Gallup's going to play in, in week three, probably. That's insane. Like, and, and, you know, adjustments kind of need to be made. So I've got two more um, on my list. Let's go. Jalen Waddle outscores Tyreek Hill. I, I couldn't agree more. Could not agree more. There's a there's a lot of narrative going in this yes. direction. The the first, the, like the narratives, even outside of the projections, like one, Tua can't throw a good deep ball, uh, veteran wide receiver changing teams, veteran wide receiver going from a Hall of Fame quarterback to – a project, you know, at, at best. And, uh, like Waddle also, I, I was looking at this yesterday. Waddle had a historic rookie year in terms of fantasy points per game. He's like, he's like of uh, the last decade, he was like the, the wide receiver for in fantasy points per game out of rookies. And the market has just decided like, yeah, him and Allen Robinson are the same thing. I mean, yeah, it, it's absolutely nuts. I think he's going to be just an absolute yak god. I think he's going to out-target Tyreek Hill. Uh, you know, the question is, can Tyreek Hill at his age and with the quarterback switch maintain, like, an absurd level of efficiency? But, like, their efficiency is going to go in opposite directions. And I do, like, actually think Waddle's going to out-target him. It would, it would make sense unless there is a role change for Tyreek Hill versus what he did in Kansas City. Yeah. Like, two was just more probably is a Waddle. little bit. Sure. I also saw some highlights from the preseason game. I'm not going to lie. It did have me. I, I got a little worried about this take. I was like, man, maybe Tyreek Hill is just a, a lot better than I, than I give him credit for. But. I don't, I don't, I don't think so, man. I, I mean, Tyreek, Tyreek is really good, but you know, the, the argument has been that the chiefs are going to be worse because they miss Tyreek, but aren't, aren't we, aren't we worried that Tyreek is going to be worse? Cause he's not playing with Pat, you know, like the, I think yeah. Pat is. I think Pat is the larger part of of that equation. I mean, how aggressive? I agree. I agree. How, like, like, what do you think is Waddle's like eighty fifth percentile season? Uh, I don't. I mean, what he's probably catching ninety five balls or something. I mean, he caught ninety balls last year. I think. I think. I think, I think he if, can do what he did last year with way more efficiency. I think. He, I was going to say balls. I think he could be like a, a Jarvis Landry, but like good after the catch instead of just falling down. Right. Yeah. So he was at 9.8 yards per reception off 104 catches last year. So it was only 7.3 yards per target, even though he had a 74% catch rate. So basically like you get that yards per reception up to like 11 and a half, and then you throw in, you know, some more touchdowns. We could get a, get a 104, 1250 and 10 season. Yeah. Uh, I'll, I'll give, I'll give this one. Eno Benjamin is the best zero running back candidate. He's going to, Daryl Williams is going to get cut. You know, Benjamin is going to be in the chase Edmonds role in the Arizona offense. And the, the coaching staff is going to see that he is better, has more juice and is fine in pass blocking. And is going to finish as like a top 15 
running back and he has been stone free all off season. Yeah. I think, Eno is a really good pick. I think I, for a little bit fell for the Daryl Williams thing. And I was like, Daryl Williams is a really good pick. And then it, you know, clear. It, it seems to be headed for, Eno. I've also been burned by, Eno because I've drafted him the last two years as kind of a zero running back pick, but I absolutely dig it. I think I have a tough time with Connor too, in general, because Connor, Connor is, is the perfect, like you optimized for week one. So you drafted a lot of James Connor and you feel really yeah. good about it, but there are so many ways his season can go poorly. And I don't even think he's a dead zone running back. If he does stay healthy, cause they, they threw to him the, the ball like a decent bit last season, but it's just like, I, I guess I wonder if, I mean, when things happen over the course of the season, like Edmonds gets hurt, they don't have that many options now coming into the year. I'm I'm curious to see what Connor's role is week one, if it's full workhorse or not. Like I'm worried it might not even be week one full workhorse. But but that's like yeah. that's like worry. That's not like I mean if they do if they do cut Daryl, he'll probably be fine for the first month or six five, six weeks or whatever, and and you know, we'll just be in the chase role. It'll just be a matter of yeah. if he can sustain the per, per, the performance from last year. Or, I mean, what, he's 28, 29? Like, you know, he's not it, it just happens. I don't think he's that yeah. old, actually. Do, do you he got is. any more, or are you, are you running I got, out? I got one more. Okay, let's go. Last one is that Kenneth Walker is very fantasy relevant in the playoff stretch. I could see him being relevant then, but I don't, I'm not really on board with this take. Like nah, he, he kind of, he kind so he checks all the boxes of someone I don't look for. Like me and, me and, and. I know he was on the zero running back list or whatever, but like, so Number the first one. thing is, the first thing is, especially in managed leagues, I absolutely detest drafting players who are injured or suspended. Now, this is not as true in best ball, right? I'll take Gallup, I'll take Hopkins, whatever. Big in best ball. Yes. But in managed leagues, I really do not like to take guys who are already hurt, guys who are already suspended. And I particularly don't like taking running backs who get hurt because let's say Kenneth Walker comes back in week three from this hernia thing. And then he gets into game action. It's like, okay, you're going to get tackled 12 times or whatever. They're just, it's just so like, theoretically a wide receiver can come back and get through a game without getting tackled. Right. Or, or not getting hit cleanly, but that's not happening to a running back. Like he's going to come in. He's going to get, he's going to get a helmet in the groin, you know, like that just happens. Then the other thing is, I mean, Seattle is horrible. They are terrible anyway. And, I, I mean, I, I suppose Penny can always get injured or whatever, but like I, I actually think the the right reaction for the Kenneth Walker dip in ADP is that Penny's ADP has not risen enough. I mean, Penny was. I, I like them both. I mean, I, I and I think they're I think they're both fine. Well, I don't really. I really don't like Kenneth Walker. I I think yeah, like, Penny I, is I think the man. Kenneth Walker is the ultimate like zero RB pick like he is. And, and I generally don't like people of his archetype either because Seattle sucks and he's not going to No, the ultimate passes, zero running back usually... pick is Rashad white, dude, you, you bet against well, you Rashad, bet against Rashad yeah. white, but I don't, but the thing with Walker is, I guess I, I, I still think Lenny needs to get hurt. Like I still think Lenny needs to get hurt. Um, it, you could be, I mean, he, uh, so, so, you know, the it's Buccaneers... Brady's last year, like, he played. He played every snap with Brady in the preseason game. White, White, Geo, and Vaughn did not get in with Brady at all. Yeah, I heard Geo might even get cut. I love White. I've been drafting a shit ton of White. The Walker take for me is like zooming out and trying not to get too micro with the team being bad and with the catching passes and just being like, how often do we get one of the best draft capital running backs who has an absurd he's he's a he's an amazing rushing prospect like from a pure rushing standpoint he is a very high end prospect and we're going to get him for basically free and the thing we're looking for a lot of times on these zero rb builds are guys that can help us second half of the season and the injury risk is is kind of cuts both ways where it's it's concerning but you're also getting him instead of round eight or nine you're getting him like round 11 um if yeah. you have, it's also an easier move if you have like if you have a deep bench or an ir spot i can see not wanting to maybe wait it out um same thing with like isaiah spiller like if you have an ir spot i like him if you don't he's like almost undraftable in like a six bench managed league yeah uh the spiller thing i think is not gonna happen the way we wanted it to right 
like uh the this no. and i've said this on like every show so people are sick of me hearing it but you know the idea with spiller was that he was going to come in and subsume the entirety of that running back two role we you know we, kelly's not going to play roundtree's not playing uh it's it's just spiller and eckler and the combination of like starting camp kind of slow getting hurt and kelly supposedly looking better than he did last year is just like it, he just became another contingent value guy yeah yeah, aren't you absolutely. aren't you worried that Ronald Jones is going to be cut by the Kansas City Chiefs, signed by the Los Angeles Chargers, and subsume that running back two role? I mean, I I didn't take any Ronald Jones in rounds ten or eleven, and I've taken a bunch lately in basically the last round. So I'm I'm kind of okay with it. That, that wouldn't be so bad. Yeah. All right. My my final hot take: Ramondre Stevenson finishes as a top ten running back in fantasy points per game. He plays on third downs. He scores 10 touchdowns, and uh, even though the Patriots, I think, are going to take a step back as an offense this year with Joe Judge and Matt Patricia calling plays, uh, one of these things that Gretch has found that I always come back to in the offseason is that the late rising running backs, there tends to be like an, an inertia keeping them from rising all the way. That like I think Damian Pierce is a great example. I, I could totally see an argument for Damian Pierce being like the running back 14 or whatever. Oh, not, that, not that I'm chasing him up there. But I think Ramondre is another great example of this, where his circumstance changed in two major ways. James White retired, and Ty Montgomery already got injured. Yeah. And this this Pierre Strong hype we were hearing really slowed down once they started playing in preseason, and Pierre Strong didn't look very good. Like I, I think Ramondre has like a combine what Shane Vereen and Rex Burkhead used to do and put it in one role. That is like an amazing player in fantasy football. Yeah. Uh, Levitan's been on the Ramondre hype train basically all offseason, and it has been one that we've kind of chased up the board because his ADP rise has coincided with like what you said, like things looking even better and even rosier. It's not just hype. Yes, I mean you probably you probably by your conservative nature are like I'm going to start taking Damian Harris now, and I actually took I think Damian Harris was a great round ten pick in for zero running back teams in the main event. It's like you can't really ask for much better than immediately starting a guy in week one and feeling like you're drawing live to a touchdown every single week. We've got Ramondre RB 29, 84th overall. So what's that like round like end of round seven? So that's, that's actually, that's actually pretty in line with the market. It's just, I think he, like he's got such this disgusting you're getting, feeling. You're getting him in home leagues at, at the seven, eight turn. Yeah. I, I took, I just, I did just take him there in my home league draft, my home league draft, by the way, so bad my 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 well my my friends now are not bad at fantasy football anymore there was at at one point 14 straight wide receivers went in the mid rounds of wow. my home league which is like i i did not ever expect my home league uh to turn into piss boys and and here we are it's kind of a tough scene i joined a league last year and came in dead last and people are just like think i'm such an idiot it's just like and i punted yeah. for keepers for this year yep let's hope let's hope that goes better this year all right, Davis, well, I, I, people... I got I got one more. I got one okay. more. All right, one more. You gotta you gotta get out before we get back to getting. Raheem word. Mostert has multiple eighteen plus fantasy point games as a member of the Miami Dolphins. Thank you. I felt like a crazy. We've had Mostert so far ahead of ADP, and I felt like a crazy person all off season. I like Mostert. He's been one of my favorite late round running back picks. So I mean, it's it's August 29th. He's not hurt. That, that, so that's that's already that's already a check, right? August twenty ninth, he's not hurt, and you know, I mean, you can make the argument, oh, they paid Edmonds, but I would make the other argument, which is Mike McDaniel's literally coached this dude for the last three years and was like, you know, who I need to fit my scheme, this guy, right? He could have brought in Jeff Wilson Jr. It could have been it could have been someone else. He could they could have signed Jarek McKinnon in in free agency, and they went after Mostert. My argument is more that I think Sony Michelle is not going to play as much as people think, and it's going to be and, and most are he's, he's, kind of he's going to be in the same role he was in in Los Angeles, where he's break glass in case of emergency, right? That's I mean, Michelle That's, didn't play at all until Henderson got banged up. Yeah. All right, Davis, tell the people where they can find you heading into draft season. Sports Grid Fantasy Football Podcast, the Take Cast on TV every day from uh, 11 East to noon East. And uh, you can find me in Best Ball Mania 3, cranking out a couple more main events. And uh, yeah, hope hope to see everyone at the top of Best Ball Mania 3. 
Nice. If you're listening to this, you of course have found the Establish the Edge podcast on iTunes. We're also showing the video version of this on the Establish the Run YouTube channel. Head there, subscribe, give us a like. Helps me to continue doing free content like this. I'll be back with some more episodes this week to get you all prepped for your drafts. Thanks for tuning in, everybody.